Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Mr. Raider here with an economics lesson on budgeting. And the question that we're going to consider today is how can a monthly budget keep you out of debt and on the path to long term investment growth? Uh, that is the question to consider today, and it relates directly to our unit essential question, considering how our individual economic decisions are going to influence our ability to manage our scarce resources. So for the opening question on the Google Classroom assignment, I'm going to ask you to write down two things that you learned from this lecture, or one thing you learned and one question you have about making a monthly budget. Okay, so when you finish school, uh, what, what I want you to kind of consider is what are some of the things that might go into a monthly budget? So, for example, uh, at some point, you're probably going to have to start paying for your own food, right? Uh, at some point, if not already, you're going to have to pay for transportation expenses, whether it be a car or a subway car, a subway metro card, or a commuter rail, etc. Uh, you may have to pay for various housing expenses. It might be to sign a lease when you finish school to get an apartment on your own. Or it might be buying a house someday. Uh, paying things such as the electric bill or the water bill, right? So there's a lot of things that you're going to need to budget for when you graduate and when you start working full time at whatever level that might be. All right, so what we're going to look at today is one scenario as a class that I'm going to hold you all accountable for. Uh, when we get to the summary slide, I'm going to say those of you that want to stop at this point can end, end the video and continue on with the uh, the lesson activity on the, on the document. And then I'm going to go a little deeper for those of you that want to continue thinking about different kinds of things that might go into additional budgets uh, in postgraduate level. So what I want you to do in terms of the thinking process and the writing process, you're going to be giving financial advice. So I want you to pretend as if you were a certified financial planner. This is five years from now. You have your BBA, your Bachelor's in Business Administration. Now you're going to provide some advice to a newly recent graduate. So in this case, I want you to consider if this person, Imani, is doing an effective job at managing her finances or not. And then whether she's doing a great job or she's doing a very poor job, I want you to give her some advice to help her do even better with her investments. So I'm going to read this scenario, and all these numbers are relative as of the year 2020, just to give you some ideas in terms of salaries and in terms of real actual day-to-day -day expenses. Imani has just been hired as a content specialist at NewsCred, a local marketing firm in Manhattan. Her salary will be $42,000 a year. However, her net income will only be $28,000 after taxes and you can see the amount of uh, on average the amount of money that comes out in taxes you can go back to the paycheck lesson if you want more details as to why that's the case and she she would like to move to south slope in brooklyn right so right in between park slope and sunset park in south brooklyn with a roommate the monthly rent would be two thousand six hundred dollars to sign the lease and heat and hot water will be included if she chooses to sign the lease Furthermore, Imani is responsible for making her student loan payments, so she's going to have to pay $150 a month, as it has been seven months since her college graduation. Now, most colleges in the United States give students and grad and six months to pay off their debt before they start charging interest. Okay, she currently has $2,500 in her savings account at Chase Bank and $3,000 in her checking account at TD Bank. So now what we want to try to figure out is how much money is Imani actually working with? And then after we've identified the expenses, how can she allocate her budget in the smartest possible way to walk away with some money? So the first thing we have to do is look at what her net income is going to be for the month. So you're going to take the net income for the year, $28,140, and you're going to divide it by 12. And that's going to give you the disposable income that we have to work with, all right? Before we go any further, I just want to show you, and I'm not going to spend time really reading it, uh, the news credit specialist, I didn't make it up, like that, that is what the job actually is. Uh, and they, they go over, among other things, uh, what kind of a job they would be doing, 
what the duties of the job would be. And by all means, feel free to pause and, and read through this if it's something that you might be interested in doing. And then in terms of the qualifications, that really what they're looking for is a bachelor's degree in either journalism, communications, marketing, business, uh, equivalent experience, experience in financial services, uh, five or more years in marketing. So this really, it, it is, it's not really entry level, but with the right credentials and the right degree, it is possible to get a job along these lines. So let's go back to the scenario. And again, let's consider, okay, so what are gonna be some of the bigger expenses? So in terms of thinking about a budget, think of it like a pie chart. And the biggest expense for most people is going to be housing. Now, one of the things I want you to consider before we do any math is how much money should you actually be spending on housing, whether that be the rent on a lease or a mortgage payment or a homeowner association fee, a maintenance payment if you own a co-op or a, a condo. So in general, it's that most financial consultants would say you shouldn't be spending more than 40% of your take home net income on housing. Some uh, experts say it really shouldn't be more than, than 35%, but really 40 to 50% would be the upper threshold. And by the time you hit 45, 50%, uh, individuals are rent burdened and probably should consider downgrading to a more expensive, uh, a less expensive uh, place to live. Okay, so this table may look very familiar from your work on your quality of life innovations proposal. And really this is basically a descriptive table that you can make in a Google spreadsheet or an Excel document. So let's break down the expenses. So we have rent, electricity, the internet, gas and gas in this case is like for the for the stove turn it on to cook uh cell phone health insurance uh if, a, if your employer does not pay for your health insurance uh you have to get one through the private marketplace and if your income is too high you will not qualify for medicaid so ghi silver is one of the options in new york under the affordable health care act otherwise known as obamacare and this is for a silver plan transportation student loans, food, personal expenses, entertainment, an emergency fund, uh, just in case you maybe a car breaks down or unexpected medical bill, retirement savings saved in total. So let's break down some of the expenses. Now, if you're watching this video, I actually did a lot of the math for you. So let's take a look and see what kind of money Imani is working with. So if she does decide to sign the lease, you would take the $2,600, right? divided by two because she has a roommate. So her share of rent will be $1,300. Note already, we see a red flag. She's paying 55% of her total net income for the month on housing. So that might be something in already in the investment advice that you might say to money, you might wanna find a cheaper apartment or maybe continue living with your parents for a few years to save some income so that the rent wouldn't be such a high percentage of overall expenses. Likewise, electricity and the internet would also be divided by two, right? Because she has the roommate. Uh, in this case, maybe she's the only one cooking, so she'd pay the whole gas bill. Uh, the cell phone bills can range, but I included a median figure of $80.50. And again, if for all these percentages, what you can do is you would take the count divided by the total, and then you get the percentage, just like you did when you were doing your survey data in quality of life. So if I want to know the gas bill, it's $30 divided by 2,345, and we get 1.28%. Now notice I didn't fill in the whole thing. I just put, and I, and I said that this would be a person who would really have a very strict budget. So zero personal expenses, zero entertainment, zero emergency, and zero retirement. Now, some of you may have already added up the percentages and are saying, hey, wait, Mr. Raider, when I add it up, it's actually higher than 100%. Well, you'd be 100% correct. And in fact, she has a net savings of negative $137.49. Now, can she sign the lease and get this apartment? Yeah, she can. She does have over $2,500 in, in her bank account. If we go back to the scenario, she has $5,500 that she has in savings, $3,000 in the checking account and $2,500 in the savings account. However, she's going to be losing $137 a month, right? So in 10 months, that's $1,370 or almost, you know, about a fifth of her overall savings. So as we can see, this may not be the best plan 
for Imani. So if we look at the expenses in terms of figuring out what we can cut, housing is the easiest thing to fix. Then you would have a lot more money for all these other things. Now, the health care plan is the next biggest ticket item, but it is something that you really should have in case you know, there are emergencies or you want a physical or you want to be able to check in with your doctor. There are different plans. There's a gold, silver, and bronze plan within the state of New York. Uh, but the trade-off, there is an opportunity cost. You know, say you get the bronze plan. It's going to be cheaper per month, but then if you have to go to the doctor, it's going to be a higher copay or higher deductible. So there's different trade-offs that are involved when you make these decisions. I took the same descriptive table and just like we did in quality of life when we were making charts for our uh, survey data, we can see the breakdown of the monthly budget. Again, the biggest piece of the pie that really needs to be addressed is the rent. And that's really the issue that Imani has to deal with. Okay, so this brings us to the summary. So at this point, uh, for those of you that feel you have a good grasp of the budget, and the budgeting process, you can pause and exit out of your videos and continue on with the activity. Everybody else, I'm going to spend another few minutes, maybe up to five minutes, giving you a slightly different scenario and kind of thinking th about and discussing how one can best allocate their money. So really thinking about this big question, how the budget helps us to keep out of debt. If we go back to Imani, she's going to be in debt pretty quick because her budget is way out of whack and it's not going to help her. We want to consider how our personal spending choices is going to influence our savings, right? How then our savings influence our ability to pay for emergency expenses when they come up. And then really considering, is it necessary to save for retirement? And the question at the end of the day becomes, would you like to be able to retire at the age of 60 and maybe have 30 years of retirement, 30, 35 years, ideally? Do you want to retire at 70? Do you want to never retire? And you know, you may say, I'll never retire, but you know, the human body begins to break down over time unless you really keep active to try to keep things going. So it's just something to consider. All right, so here's our second scenario. This one is for those of you that are thinking about grad school and might be thinking about having more money to work with than our first scenario. But as you'll see, even in this context, sometimes it is still hard to budget money. So I'm going to read it to you and kind of talk you through some of the things that will go into this budget. So in this scenario, we have Ryan. He's hired as an attorney in a corporate firm in Brooklyn. He's going to start his salary at $96,000. And he chose to deduct 10% of his salary for his 401k retirement contributions. So again, right away, we're going to take out uh, 90, at least $9,600 for the year, right? Because that's 10% of 96000 And that's going to go into a savings account. Um, remember, 401k is not a bank account. It's an investment. So it has stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, which means that as the market goes up, Ryan will earn money. As the market goes down, Ryan loses money. So again, there's that trade-off when you look at stock type investments. So his net income for the month for the year is going to be ninety-six thousand, and you're going to need to subtract ninety-six hundred dollars. I'm going to take my calculator and do that now. So ninety-six thousand minus ninety-six hundred. Ryan only has eighty-six thousand four hundred dollars to of, of gross income for the year. Take that number divided by 12, and really what we're looking at for the month is $7,200, which sounds like a lot of money to work with, and in many ways it is, but let's see now what actually happens. So if we take that 7200 and we take out the taxes that he's going to have to pay, he's going to have to pay $2,376 in taxes. So we're really left with, so you can see it, $4,824 of income for the month. So again, that's not as much as what we might have originally thought. Now, he wants to move, him in, move to Manhattan in the Chelsea neighborhood. And the apartment that he wants is $2,900 a month. All the utilities are included, so that means he's not going to have to pay the electrical, heat, hot water so on and so forth. Now his student loans, now he went to law school. Law school could be very expensive. We could be looking at say $150,000 in loans. 
uh, and up, depending on what law school one goes to. But he has to pay $350 a month. His six-month grace period ended. His health insurance is going to cost $609. Now, note in the scenario, it says it's not subsidized by the government. So in the last scenario, uh, Imani working in NewsCred, she actually was making enough money where the government would subsidize part of her health insurance premium. Ryan makes too much money, so the government's not going to give him any subsidies. And the employer in this context doesn't offer health care. So that's something to think about, too, when you look for a job and a salary. If your employer offers health care, it might be something to look into because that can save you thousands of dollars over the course of a year. If we take Ryan here, $609 times 12 months, that's an additional $7,308 for the year that he could have essentially saved had he taken a job at a law firm that offered health insurance. Okay, so Ryan's going to take uh, $89.99 a month for internet, $121 for the 30-day unlimited metro card, although I think now it's $127, so the scenario really could use an update, but that's okay. He's gonna, he wants the budget, $300 for food, $200 for personal expenses, and $150 for entertainment. And I gave him the same starting point as Imani, $2,500 in savings and $3,000 in checking. So when you do the math on this one, the rent, $2,900, electricity, $100. When we add up all the numbers, right, everything done, he would have $207.75 left over for savings. So he could put that into an emergency fund and a bank account. He could put that into investments. He has some choices here. But keep in mind, he's saving more than $207. He's also saving $800 a month for his retirement accounts. You take the $9,600 divided by 12, and you get $800. So he's actually saving about $1,000 a month. So if we take $1,007.75, and we divide that out by his monthly income, he's actually saving about 20%, which is good. You know, there's definitely some good things here, but at the end of the day, even though Ryan makes a lot of money, he only has $200 of disposable income for a mercy fund, or if he wants to go out a little bit more for entertainment, or if he wants to spend a little bit more on food, right? These are things to keep in mind. And same thing, we look at Ryan's budget, wait, Look at that rent, $2,900 a month, 60%. Think about what we said about being rent burdened, paying more than 50% of your income on rent. Yes, he, he does make more money. Yes, he can do it. Yes, he will not go into debt. However, if we're really trying to get him to save more money, maybe he might want to consider getting a roommate. Or if he's going to be working in a law firm in Brooklyn, why not live in Brooklyn? And then you can save on the transportation cost. And you could probably find a cheaper neighborhood to live in as well. And you can save money in that way as well. All righty, everybody. So this is going to do it for today's lesson. Hope you all enjoyed uh, learning more about finance and about money management. Please reach out to me if you have any, qu any questions going forward as we continue learning about personal finance. Right, everybody have a great day.